Blueprint LSAT video take one. I'm Will, welcome to Blueprint. Um, gonna go run through three things today. First, I'm gonna introduce myself, tell you a little bit about me. Second, I'm gonna give you a few tips on how to study for the LSAT. Third, we're gonna run through a nice basic question, pretty typical of what you'll see on the LSAT. So first, me, I'm a tax guy. Uh, I graduated in 2011 from a state school in New York. I worked for a little while before going to law school, and during the two years, I took my time to really study the LSAT and get a good score. I took an LSAT prep class uh, where I kind of learned the basics, but really how I learned it was I got some books, I sat down, I got to work early, about an hour, hour and a half early every day, and I really studied the hell out of it for that hour before work. Uh, doing that five days a week, plus taking some time on the weekends to do practice tests, practice questions, uh, I saw my score go from a good score to a great score. Uh, my LSAT score probably is what got me into Georgetown. I wound up going to the IRS for the honors program there. I'll be a government lawyer at least for a little while, maybe go to the private sector after that. But like I said, I'm a tax guy. Now in tax, we don't crunch numbers, we're not accountants. What we do is we see what a taxpayer has done, we see how they've structured a transaction, and we try to get the best result from that structure or tell the taxpayer, you should change the structure like this to achieve this result. And oddly enough, that's very similar to what you see in the LSATs. You have a question and the LSAT test writers follow a kind of a generic format where it's a very predictable style of what they're trying to elicit from the test taker. So my skills in tax, I think, translate very well. Um, I don't think I'm going to convince many of you to take tax. It's not the most exciting area to most people, but if you like it, you like it. I like it, and it's going very well for me. But let's move on. So three tips for someone who's going to prepare for the LSAT. One, take it seriously. You cannot treat this like a test in college where, you know, you study in the two nights before, really cram it and get it done. That doesn't work. It's, it's simply, there's too much material there. You're not gonna get it all. You're gonna regret not doing the work early on. Take it seriously the entire time that you're studying. That means if you're in school currently, treat it as if you have a second class. If you're working currently, treat it like you have an extra hour or two of work every day that you have to get done. I guarantee you, law school is probably going to be harder. Like I said, I guarantee you, law school is going to be harder than any college uh, curriculum that you've taken. And if you're working, it's probably going to be harder than what you're doing at work. The first year of law school is absolutely the hardest. Second year is the most work. Third year, kind of have it figured out. It's not as bad, but those three years are very stressful. So you need to take it seriously. Second, treat it like a game that you can beat. The LSATs can be beaten. You need to figure out how to beat it, and it's hard, but you can do it. It is a game that can be beaten. Uh, third, don't take it too seriously. And I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to take away from the fact that you have to take it seriously, but don't devote your entire life to it. You need to do other things. You need to be a well-rounded individual. Law schools like well-rounded individuals. You'll go crazy if you don't have something else going on in your life. So. Still see your friends, maybe in the month before the test, you're gonna cut down in your social life a little bit, but take it seriously, just not too seriously, to the point where it's counterproductive. Now let's get into the meat, why you're here. We're gonna learn how to do a, a pretty simple LSAT question. So first, give it a quick read, and uh, there's a, a pretty good format on how you should read the question. First, read the question. You always know where the question is on the test because it's below this nice little passage setting you up. So here's the question. If the statements above are all true, which of the following must also be true on the basis of them, the statements above? So you know that you're looking for a true statement based on the statements above you. So now I'll give it a nice quick read over. This summer, Jennifer, who worked at KVZ Manufacturing for just over three years, plans to spend with plans to spend with her family the entire four weeks of paid vacation to which she is entitled this year. Anyone who has worked at KVZ Manufacturing for between one and four years is automatically entitled to exactly three weeks paid vacation 
each year, but can apply for up to half of any vacation time that remains unused at the end of one year to the next year's vacation. Then the question, if the above are true, what must also be true? So I want you to look at this question, and I want you to notice two different parts of this question, and they're very neatly divided by, a, by the sentences. Here is a change of sentence. So everything below the line, you'll notice, is a rule, it is a rule that is applied in this factual scenario. Anyone who has worked at KVZ Manufacturing for between one and four years is automatically entitled to exactly three weeks paid vacation. Jen, who worked at KVC for just over three years, obviously qualifies. They can also apply up to half of any vacation time that remains unused at the end of one year to the next year's vacation. So two rules. One, if you worked at KVZ for, or, so for people who worked there between one and three years, one, you are automatically entitled to exactly three weeks paid vacation, and two, you can apply up to half of that time that's unused to the next year. So we've got two rules to apply. Now look at the top half. This summer, Jennifer, our person uh, who qualifies, plans to spend with her family the entire four weeks of paid vacation to which she is entitled this year. All right, so we've got a basic idea of what's going on in this question. We have to apply one and two to, these, to this factual scenario and decide which of our uh, answers can, can be true. So let's give them a quick read through. First, Jennifer did not use two weeks of the paid vacation to which she was entitled last year. That sounds like maybe it could apply, so we're gonna leave that alone. B, if Jennifer continues to work for KVZ Manufacturing, she will be entitled to three weeks paid vacation next year. Uh, off the bat, that sounds like it could apply. C, the majority of KVC's employees each year, uh, all of the, uh, use each year all of the paid vacation time to which they are entitled. Now our question really doesn't talk about most KVC employees. We don't know how many have been there between three, one and three years, or one and four years. We don't know if this applies. Maybe it's true, but we can't say it's true based on our scenario. So kind of off the bat, you should be able to say C doesn't really apply. D, last year, Jennifer took only one week of paid vacation time to which she was entitled. Uh, let's, uh, maybe that's true. We don't know immediately off the bat. We'll leave it alone. And then E, KVC manufacturing sometimes allows extra vacation time to employees who need to spend more time with their families. That's another one where we're looking at it, it's like, huh? Does that, do we really know anything about that from our facts? Uh, sometimes allows, we can't, that's a qualified statement. We can't really say it's true based on our facts. So E, we can immediately get rid of. So we've narrowed it down to three. Now in most questions, you're gonna be able to narrow it down to three almost immediately off the back, off the bat. There, the LSAT test writers uh, need to fill five answers. And so usually two to three of them, you can dismiss out of hand. And we've got two you can dismiss out of hand. So let's go back through. Uh, I'm gonna go in reverse order, because why not? Uh, D, last year, Jennifer took only one week of paid vacation time to which she was entitled. Let's run that, that uh, answer through our rules and see if it applies to our facts. So, if she only took one year of vacation last year, one week of vacation last year, she would be entitled to roll forward at least two weeks or one half of two weeks vacation this year, right? She would be entitled to roll forward that well, one week because it's one half of the two weeks she didn't use. And that seems to apply for a second, right? Because uh, she plans to spend four weeks, she was already entitled to three, and that one week adds up to four, right? But remember, she worked at KVC Manufacturing for just over three years. And our facts seem to say that you can roll forward vacation. We don't know if in the first two years that she worked there, she had any unused vacation time so she could roll forward. If she rolled forward, you know, the maximum amount of vacation time, one and a half weeks for two years, she would constantly be increasing the amount 
a vacation she could roll forward year after year. So we don't know that she used only one week. If she used only one week and she was entitled to three plus three equals six weeks of vacation, she could theoretically roll forward all three week or, or three additional weeks of vacation time. So that does not, uh, we can't say that that D is definitely true. So we're gonna cross that out. Then let's look at A. Jennifer did not use two weeks of paid vacation time to which she was entitled last year. We're gonna say she was entitled to at least two weeks of vacation time based on that answer. Uh, we're gonna run it back through our rule and our scenario. So she did not use two weeks of the paid vacation time to which she was entitled last year. Let's, again, use our, uh, our, our most extreme scenario. Uh, she rolled forward uh, year, or, oh, year after year, I guess it would be three weeks. Uh, she rolled forward a week and a half to one year and then uh, two and three quarters weeks to the next year. Um, so again, so Jennifer did not use two weeks of paid vacation time to which she was entitled last year. If that was true, theoretically, she could be rolling forward uh, more than the one week based on our factual scenarios. We know she only has one week rolled forward from last year because she was entitled to the entire four weeks. So A, again, can't be true. For good measure, let's look at B. If Jennifer continues to work for KBZ Manufacturing, she will only be entitled to three weeks of paid vacation next year. Well, let's look at our factual scenario. She's spending all four weeks to which she's entitled. All four weeks, the entire four weeks, means that she's not rolling forward any unused vacation time. If she's not rolling forward any vacation time, and she's only allowed to roll forward additional time if it's unused, then she would only be entitled to three weeks because she would only have been there for four years. This is, you know now, the correct answer, B. And this is kind of the basic uh, format for this type of question. Uh, you can call it whatever you want. I would call it a syllogism because it says, if all are true, if A, then, which is also true, B. If you have a syllogism type question, you know that you need to take all of the answers, get rid of the ones you can dismiss off bat, and then run them through our rules and our factual scenario. That's the basic way to do it. When it's not gonna be easy at first, but once you learn the rule, you learn to beat this part of the test. And once you learn to beat this part of the test, you get comfortable with the test, you're gonna be able to get through it very quickly, you knock it out of the way, you move on to the hard stuff, you're gonna have an easy time with the LSAT. So, again, I'm Will, the tax guy. Hope this was helpful, thanks.